Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams Tea Podcast where we spill the jams and spin the tea. This week we're coming at you with two new reviews for two new records. We're going to be talking about the new album from Perfume Genius, Ugly Season. We're also going to be talking about the new album from Asian Glow, Stalled Flutes, Memes? I don't know what the fuck that title is supposed to mean. Fruit, fruit stall. Beans. Two, two artists we've covered in the past. We covered Perfume Genius's last album in the second episode of this podcast. So, wow. you know, it's always good to make you feel old when it comes around time for a full album cycle to pass and another artist is back with a new album. But before we get to that, loyal viewers may remember that a week ago today, or six oh, days wow. ago today, we dropped the jam- the Great Jams and Tea Music Quiz of 2022. A great video. We have been really surprised with how well it's done views-wise. So if you haven't already checked it out, go and check it out. A lot of fun. Uh, we really tested ourselves on some obscure knowledge, and it was a great time. And the outcome of that was that Jake emerged the victor for the second year in a row. And as a result of that, he got the prize, which is the right to assign the rest of us each a discography of his choice that we have to listen to in full and report on each week on the Jams and Tea podcast in our What We've Been Listening To segment. And Jake elected to really leave us hanging in suspense here uh, and wait until today to find out exactly what it is that the three of us will be listening to and reporting back on each week on this podcast. And so... As the placements were, Morgan came in second, I came in third, and August came in fourth. Jake has assigned us each discography in relation to how that compares in quality, depending on how well you did in the quiz. And so from here, I'll leave Jake to reveal uh, (laughs) the projects that are going to be consuming our lives for a short time. We didn't exactly have any set rules for this, but that was sort of the encouraged thing here. But so I decided to take this as literally as possible and go for uh, discographies to basically have a percentage of albums that perfectly correlates with what place people came in. So first off, Morgan, who came in second place, the discography that you are going to be getting is both the shortest discography and the best discography, Uh, a band that, to my knowledge, you have not listened to a single album from. You are going to get the discography of death metal band extraordinaire Gorguts. So for each week in the future, you will report back with a new album from them. Yeah, plus Riley. you have to do Pleiades Dust as well, their last EP. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the, their final technical release. Uh, That's sick. So I can't wait. Riley, I have chosen yours for more reasons than just uh, its correlated percentage, but also because this will almost flawlessly build up to a new album of theirs. Oh, really? Because, Riley, you are doing the discography of Muse. Oh, oh Christ. <laughs> the only the only problem with that is that i've already heard every muse album but i can do like i know i can do but, muse of yeah. them every week if you want to that's and that's that's what i want i i, I guess you, and i will adhere to the spirit which is that i will make myself listen to them all again yes, but yeah that is what i, <laughs> I have heard them all but that will be fun i suppose <laughs> all right and Fuck. august this was a tough one just because I could have gone with any bad band or artist. I could have gone with anybody, but I wanted to do something that was podcore in a sense, uh, in that we have talked about this person before. And that I think that it will mine a perfect amount of interest, uh, for each of these little segments that you will provide. I think it'll provide with enough entertainment for everyone August, I am assigning you with discography of Toby Mac. Yeah! <laughs> Toby's and, back! How many albums and, does he have? You see... Uh, he... Okay. Uh, there. I think he has... I wanted to say I counted no more than eight. I And um, 
I think oh, what I want to do is instead of August doing Welcome to Diverse City, because we have covered it, that instead of that in its place, uh, Toby has a remix album for each one of his records. So instead of Welcome to Diverse City, he can do the remix record. Oh, instead. renovating. Yeah. Uh, renovating. Yes, exactly. Arrow. Diverse City diverse is what city. it's called. Exactly. Oh, boy. So, this will be amazing. Additionally, a uh, big week for us because we are doing our record club this week, which is on Porcupine Trees, The Incident. Uh, that is the last album we're doing in our sort of pseudo 2000s Porcupine Tree retrospective to prepare for the fact that we're reviewing the new record next week. So go check that out. Get caught up. Listen to all those records. Watch all those episodes. Go watch the episodes that we put up uh, recently of stuff on the channel. We most recently, other than, of course, the great jams, jams and tea quiz, talked about uh, the Fiona Apple album, When the Pawn, the dot, 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 dot. And we also talked about um, covers of songs that we are particularly fond of that we like more than the originals. That was a really interesting little video there. Yeah, and it ended up being, I guess, more of a debate than just like us listing mm -hmm. songs that we agree were better than the original we had a good chance in that video i think to explore like what makes a cover good versus sometimes what can detract from a great cover in the opinions of some as well so i think that was actually more of an insightful video maybe than it might seem on the surface so if you haven't checked that one out it's a really fun discussion video it's nice and fast paced go and watch that one really really proud of it and we will definitely be doing more discussion videos, sort of list discussion videos as a group in the future, because I think that they give us a chance to do something that's more fresh and puts a fresher spin on what our dynamic is as a group. So, yeah. One um, final announcement before we get into the yes, thick of yes, things. Yes. Most exciting. For fans of our non-podcast work, uh, Glacier Flower is back. We have a new uh, double EP. So it's basically an album of material. This is 40 minutes of new material coming out on July 1st. And it is us, I guess I'll give away a bit of the, bit of the concept here. This is us taking our old material from 2018. So before you've even heard Glacier Flower albums and onwards and revitalizing it with some newer production and kind of cleaning it up and sequencing it in a way that has more of a flow to it. So that's what you can expect in a week's time. Yes, awesome. very excited for this. The twin EPs are going to be called Infinite Past and Infinite Future. And yes, as August said, they will be dropping on Friday, the 1st of July. So we will be making sure there's a link to that when that happens as well. But go and follow Glacier Flower on Bandcamp by hitting the link up in the description right now. Or else will beat your ass. Or you can find us on Apple Music, Spotify, wherever you get your music from. Exactly. We're also there too. And let's, without further ado, get into what we have been listening to for the past seven days. Jake, what have you been listening to? A lot of EPs, just because I'm still continuously working on a project of my own personal interest that involves listening to a lot of EPs. And that led me to listening to a thing called the sisters ep by a band called pulp little british rock band that i'd never listened to before which led me to because i liked the sisters ep so much it led me li to listen to different class uh by the band which is just fucking amazing like my god i really like that ep and i think i like the album even more than that it's a flavor of brit pop and rock that's just so purely textural every instrument just feels like it sounds the most interesting it has ever sounded at that point it's really sharply written pop music it's really like wry and and as the title might imply kind of class conscious it, it was just a really fascinating listen just because i haven't heard a lot of stuff from that era or scene and it made me a whole lot more like interested in stuff like it so i mean highly mm. recommend anything from the band pulp yeah. that record in particular i think like they've and they've certainly benefited from getting less airtime and attention generally speaking than some of their brit pop associates like blur and oasis but i think that yeah. perhaps as a result of that I've kind of come around to preferring Pulp on the whole to both bands. I think that different class 
Um, I'm eight or as, as close as I am to 13, although by Blur, although that's not really a Britpop album at all, uh, and Park Life, which definitely is, I think Different Class might be my favorite record in this wave from any of these bands. Uh, it's just a really incisive, really witty, really funny record like Jarvis Cocker has an immaculate sense of humor and he is a great writer very funny multi-talented instrumentalist as well uh and there's just so many classic songs on that record I mean not to mention Common People which is one of the greatest songs of the 90s but Disco 2000 fantastic uh Sorted for Ease and Whiz Underwear uh the incredibly and also there's like a sly undercurrent of sort of transgressive attitudes on this album that where oh, yeah. Jarvis is kind of like almost daring you to like hate him almost like he, he has this acerbic wit that could if you were super like you know the super like sensibility of uh kosher clean progressiveness then his brand of really sardonic uh humor might kind of put you off a little bit especially songs like pencil skirt for instance but i yeah. think that it's it, he gets away with it because he's such a fucking rascal and he always backs <laughs> up what yeah. he, he always backs up his attitude with really really infectious and well-constructed songs so i think so that catchy. pulp are a great band to sort of get back into pulp and um bands like pulp and sway and all those kinds of like great bands from that era that kind of got a little bit overshadowed his and hers and this is hardcore as well the two albums either side of it are great yeah, too. i'm gonna check those out they're really a band that just kind of came in delivered some heat and then just cut well they had a rough start it wasn't really till his and hers that they found their sound but then they dropped a bunch of great records and then just sort of stopped making music and it's a pretty like and that's benefited them i think because they don't come with as much baggage as some bands do they really kind of quit while they were ahead more or less and it's benefited them in the long run. I listened to an EP that I came across completely tangentially that led me to listen to an album that uh, you two had listened to. And that's uh, Hope's Falls, The Satellite Years. And because I had listened to their EP, The Far Pavilions, I like the EP a little bit more than The Satellite Years, if I'm being totally honest. It, it was an album I enjoyed, I thought was good. Something about it didn't fully click with me. Maybe I, I need to give it a, a, a re-listen, but I feel like the EP, which had a little bit more of the emo-tinged sound that you could kind of hear on the Satellite Years resonated with me just a little bit more. The the, the combination of sounds on there, maybe I, I wanted a little bit more of the sort of like weird progressive spaciness. I think I found that facet of the album sound a little bit more interesting than the purely heavy metalcore stuff which i found occasionally a bit of a chore to get through but still overall it was a good experience so i'm not opposed to revisiting it just yeah. to see if it grows on me a little bit maybe some of it might have just been the burden of expectations yeah. because i don't think hopes fall are as heavy of a band as they're led on to be like as far as metalcore goes i'd say they're on in a lighter side honestly and, and some of oh, that's yeah. just their wild experimentation and some of that's just the literal riffs are not as heavy as like a converge record for instance mm -hmm. and, and i know you're more inclined to the converge side of stuff so perhaps that could be a, a bit of what's holding you back although mm -hmm. you know listen to it again in a couple months maybe your uh, tune will be changed maybe not you know also, um, August, Quite if you're looking for record club ideas, that album does turn 20 in October. Oh, okay. Oh, shit. So there we go. Um, well, maybe I can force Jake to listen to it again <laughs> in a couple months. Yeah, sometimes some space from it. it. Some space, because it's got space, space rock sound in it. Because it's got some space themes, yeah. redshift, oh. yeah. center of the universe, Doug Marsh. How the fuck did I go through that? That was... <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, in terms of, uh, I've listened to uh, a couple of EPs that have sort of led me to albums as I've been talking about. Another one being, um, I listened to a band I've mentioned in the past, a uh, sort of doom metal, stoner metal band, uh, Elder. I listened to their EP, Spires Burn slash Release, which is 
just two really big ass songs that are just heavy as a motherfucker if you really like the sort of newer wave of stoner metal bands like Sleep, but if you're also inclined towards traditional Black Sabbath, this is totally for you. Uh, it made me re-listen to an album of theirs uh, that I gave a listen to a couple of months ago called Dead Roots Stirring, which is one of my favorite albums that I've listened to, uh, new albums that I've listened to all year, like genuinely one of the most consistent one of the heaviest and one of the most like satisfying metal sort of stoner metal albums I've heard since like oh, I don't know maybe the newest this, record but and also quite important has titties on the cover does it now oh man yeah That's, I didn't even notice that I just thought there was a fucking tree or something there's a tree uh, and there is a, a, a very nice looking lady uh, sitting at the base of the tree. Well, I was hoping that the tree had tits, honestly. <laughs> yeah, that would have been cooler. <laughs> Rule um, 34. But I also listened to two Shoegaze EPs from bands that I really, really like. Um, I listened to Ride's EP Fall, and I also listened to the Radio Department EP uh, Pulling Our Weight. Uh, both of them, exceptional stuff. Uh, the um, Ride EP ends with uh what is i think the best ride song and i think it's your favorite what is the name of that song again i can't remember well, my, i have listened to it on my favorite ride song is vapor trail which i don't think is on that ep never mind it might not be that one then but i think it is on vapor or at least it closes with uh that particular or with a particular song from that album uh, but it's an exceptional EP. I, I really, really enjoyed it. Really, really want to go back and listen to just the rest of their stuff just because I've only heard Nowhere. And the Radio Department EP, I actually ended up preferring a little bit, which is a sort of dream pop shoegaze band that I think is deeply underrated. I've been listening to their album Clinging to a Scheme like all year just because I love that record. And I've been meaning to listen to their other stuff because apparently they have more good albums than just that. I think Zach first turned me on to them. And that's fantastic too. Like, again, if you really like shoegaze or anything in this field, this is an essential listen for you. Like, you have to hear this kind of shit. Really great flow to this one. One of the better ones that I had heard. And I guess the last thing I'll talk about, I wanted to sort of build to this because this is the first new listen of 2022 that isn't a new release that I gave a 10 out of 10 to the like I went back and looked through and I was just like have I li not listened to a new album not from this year that I haven't given a 10 and that was the case and that is because I listened to an a classic record I listened to the zombies odyssey and oracle I've been listening to this constantly constantly because it is a flawless flawless record maybe my favorite pop rep record of the 60s overall just because I, I don't know what the deal is with this band because seemingly out of nowhere drop a pet sounds level pop album and then just disappear so i don't know what the fuck happened i don't know what exactly but i am simply just thankful that we got this record out of it because it is one of the most divinely sounding albums i have ever heard and that's and this the the raw sound of it is comparable to something like pet sounds which if you watched our episode on that you'll know we hold in the highest of regards in terms of how that like record is produced and constructed but another thing that makes this album so fucking fantastic is the fucking storytelling the songs on here each of them paint such an amazing little portrait care of cell 44 one of my favorite opening tracks I've heard in recent memory of just a song about someone who's like lover or loved one had gone to prison. And it's sort of this song that's about basically everything that's like left unsaid of once they get out of prison and like they get to meet up. And it's sort of the like the, the expectation and longing that they had been put on since they had been separated. And there's sort of a, a gloom and a darkness to that song that sort of lingers in the background that you sort of get the impression that this story is not going to end well. And that kind of feeling sort of pervades over a lot of the album. 
you have the second song arose for emily which is like i'm pretty sure i just called it uh, the beatles eleanor rigby if it was somehow even sadder and it it, 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 it is there's also songs like uh this will be our year which is one of my favorite oh. like romantic like sort of songs ever like it takes so much like it, it takes imagine like the highlights of like you still believe in me or something off of pet sounds yes this is somehow like even better the thing about this album is that it is when i when we say it's a perfect flawless album i can't emphasize enough how much i mean that like there are six yes now i have a pretty stringent and pretty hard sort of criteria for rating songs particularly like at the really highest level 12 songs on this record Six of them are 10 out of 10. The other six are all nine out of 10. There is nothing less than utterly spectacular on this record. And I feel like there's no way of talking about it without really like hyping it up to a certain extent, but it is one of those records that really lives up to that. I think where not a yes. second of it is wasted. The storytelling, as you say, is brilliant all throughout. It is very much like a Pet Sounds, except without the kind of weird excursions of the title track or like moments that feel a little bit more interstitial. That sort of stuff is, is absolutely not here. It is, um, and also yeah. like a record that's influential and it casts such a shadow over so much pop music that, you know, the fact that it's not talked about more often is kind of staggering. Like, very much exemplifies, I guess, you know, the fact that the zombies never became like a household name because maybe they did just drop this one great record and then kind of fell off the map. They didn't kind of hang around long enough to be a kind of consistent presence in pop culture, which is maybe why they're not remembered as much. But basically everyone who has heard this record loves it, I think. I mean, it's got a, an amazing 4.09 on Rate Your Music from 17,000 ratings. So it's not just like a, a small number of people love it to a certain extent. It's like, this is a very beloved record, but the zombies for sure don't get their due. And for that reason, I have actually made this a record club in August alongside the Kinks Village Green Preservation Society because those two records both came out in 68 and they're both distinctly brilliant but different visions of psychedelic pop slash rock music through these very kind of similar, but also quite distinct lenses and not as a way of like comparing and saying, which one is better, but like they both do different things in ways that I think together give you a very holistic picture of 60s pop music and 60s rock music at its finest. August, what have you been listening to in the last couple of weeks that you want to shout out? This podcast started with five members. We're down to four, 80%. This album I'm talking about has five ratings on Rate Your Music. I'm one of them, 20%, 80 plus 20, 100. Three members here currently. I'm going to tell you the names of three songs on here, and you'll get exactly what this record is going for. Another Hanging, Camel Dragged to Death, and Civil War Bukaki. <laughs> the album I am talking about is from a, a guy called uh, John Schuler, and it is called The Lesser Angel of Failure. This is a drone and freak folk album that's fairly obscure. And he was part, and uh, now John Schuler was part of a, a big super group. The Master Musicians of Bukaki was their name. Oh. And uh, his his solo effort, this is his one solo effort, and this is a trip of an album. It is this like 50 minute long, menacing, drony, folky record full of fucking freaky, weird shit happening constantly. And it, it kind of all coheres as this one singular sweeping song. And, and you've got like some great moments on here, like Electric Candyland, which just kick the record off to this blazing start after the cold open of another hanging. It's ridiculously underrated, and I think it's quite good. So John Schuler, Lesser Angel of Failure, check it out. It's basically only on Bandcamp is really where you can find it and uh, nowhere else. So good luck, have fun. Uh, that album's pretty good. 
so I got around to uh, something released in 2020. I'd been meaning to listen to it for a while, but I've just got to it from uh, a little up and comer kind of R and B artist, I guess you could say, Joji on the uh, the oh. 88 Rising label. Now, those of you who were in middle school in 2016 know precisely who Joji is, and I. I'm going to I'm not going to address that because it the rebrand is not really relevant to the music here although pink guy slaps you can't argue <laughs> with me anyways uh this record I it, Joji's solo career has been an interesting one because it's kept me interested but I've I've never really fallen in love with it because I think he'll release stray singles every like a couple singles every album cycle that are really good, like s- completely stand out, blow me away. And then when the actual album comes out, it'll be fine. It'll have really, it'll have pretty good production. I think his production and choice of instrumentals has always kept him from falling into this kind of category of just being completely bland and forgettable. Although the record I listened to, Nectar, the run of Give Me Love to Run and Sanctuary, those three songs in the middle are quite good. And that's like a a 10 minute stretch of really great material. It's just sandwiched in the middle of two other 20 minute chunks of so-so material. So I'm going to consistently stay looking forward to what he does next, because I I have this perhaps irrational feeling in my gut that he's going to release something that's really stand out eventually. So Riley, is there a reason why when August mentioned what he'd been listening to, you had a murderous glint in your eye that looked like you, you looked like you wanted to kill something. Well, no. Okay. (laughs) Little minor digression here. So in my first year of uni in 2016, uh, when I was staying in a hall with, and making new friends and stuff. I had a friend who I bonded with over our mutual love of Filthy Frank and how much we enjoyed like those videos and stuff. And yeah, it was definitely a different stage of my life. Let's just say that much. And so that's one thing. And then randomly like two or three years later, he messaged me out of the blue, sending me some Joji music and said, yo, you have to check this out. He's actually like on some real shit like t- talking me up about how joji who i already knew about by the way as a musician but whatever i i it was i wasn't bothered by the assumption that i didn't know this but that's fine anyway telling me all about how joji had rebranded and was doing this kind of real sad boy slick you know kind of post kid cuddy tfw win no gf type of fucking music and he was trying to tilt me up about how you know seriously deep and insightful and emotional it was and I listened to it and I can't remember what song I listened to but it legit I fuck I couldn't stand it and I haven't listened to Joji ever since and I want to think that he's gotten better and he's kind of more developed and he's less of a kind of caricature of you know, weepy incels than he always kind of stood out to as a musician to me, which is why, I mean, why I like the Filthy Frank stuff, because it felt like a total subversion of, and kind of poking fun at those kinds of, you know, internet dwelling people, while also kind of indulging in a lot of the absurdity that those people found funny and that I found funny as well. But yeah, the music just felt so limp dick and lifeless and like self-pitying and it was the most kind of mopey bullshit and I fucking hated it. But I haven't listened to him since then. And it, it definitely makes me feel good that he seems to be progressing as an artist and at least putting out good music, if even if it doesn't maintain the length of a 18 song album. I mean, uh, it's a 50 minute album. Yeah, so. which actually makes it even more annoying that it's that it's got as many as 18 songs because you just know. I don't know. You, I don't know. You've, you can do some good grindcore with that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. And he's got East Tudor on grind here. Core album. Now that's, he should that's fucking do I that. Mean. That would be fucking awesome. Mm. No, but I mean, I won't lie. I think some of his songs, look, some of the material, especially that earlier stuff, can fall very squarely into this like just fucking weepy bullshit. 
but I think the standout material are just very good pop songs mm. that have a really kinetic flow to them are, are sufficiently are like quite atmospheric, very pretty. I think his best material works really well. And I, you know, I'm not denying he mm. has that bullshit in there. Yeah. And it was the, it was the in tongues EP that was sent. To oh me. yeah. No, yeah. that EP isn't good. That's a bad EP. So I haven't listened to him since then, but you know, I, I'm sure I'm, I'm pleased to hear that he seems to be improving. And I, no, in tongues is comfortably his worst project. If that gives you any confidence, let's go it, to hear. It's <laughs> like everything after that, I think, well, the two albums after that are better. I yeah. just need Joji to get back to making movies. I need like to hear that Mad Max Fury Road was so great. I need him to get back to making great movies. Uh, it's a joke for everyone who knows his real name. I I, I get it. It's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll talk about this. Uh, someone called Kate Bush and Hounds of Love is the album. Oh. I, yeah real shit yeah it's it's good i uh i enjoyed it i need you to listen to the dreaming august i need you to i need to hear your verdict on that oh my god that is the fucking <laughs> that is the most bat shit fucking crazy album ever yeah, put out if, by if a you listen to the title artist. track and you were like is she making dog sounds that's weird the dreaming is like if every song was her making dog noises the whole time well like, literally they're and, about and, and, like aboriginal australians being literally like at the end of the dreaming she turns into a donkey and makes donkey sounds and it rules <laughs> and she screams she spends like five minutes screaming get out of my house and making donkey noises and it's the best thing you'd ever heard she turns <laughs> into a donkey how can she be a woman and a donkey Hang on. I don't know. The, the, the last wow. lyric of the album, I'm pretty sure, is just, I change into the mule. And then she makes the donkey I... noises. <laughs> <laughs> She's just fucking bug nutty. I love it. I change into oh. the mule. What the fuck? I think that's right. Hid from a girl who changes into the mule. <laughs> I, I'm curious to see how you would react to this album just because I I think the dreaming is very good, but it is a little much for me. Yeah, like there's a, the title track is literally her like doing uh, an, an Australian accent, uh, singing about running over kangaroos and then having a feature from famed <laughs> Australian folk singer and children's entertainer Rolf Harris, who was recently outed as a serial pedophile. Um, <laughs> it's got a recently lot recently is in present day or when the album was no no, released. no 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 long after the album came out but um she didn't oh. willfully choose to work with the pedophile but it's just a funny bit of context that makes him sound even crazier on the song i mean i think it would be crazier if he was outed as a pedophile before <laughs> yeah i think that's ballsy oh. can i ask if there's anything else that you want to shout out this week you can, and I do. Great. Have one more thing. Look, I'm allowed to take my fucking time here. You c <laughs> You have fucking 80 minute rants. Am I not allowed one? You fucking piece this, of shit. This diversion was my responsibility. Like, it wasn't, I was the one who. <laughs> oh, boo hoo. Kill yourself. How about? I'll fucking slap my balls. I'll fucking dip up in honey and I'll go to the local fucking forest and feed them to a bear if that makes you happy. That'll get things rolling. That'll get the fucking blood flowing out of my ball sack. Let the semen drip into the fucking grounds of the earth and sprout a fucking August tree. Then that fucking August tree will go through the forest and systematically fuck all the other trees and then the fucking ray ayanami poster box fucking telephone poles are gonna fucking dream theater my fucking ball sack i've been listening to entombed wolverine blues so this album is a death and roll album uh it, it's got some, it's from the uh, legendary swedish death metal band entombed uh, this is their third record and features the return of their kind of 
uh, vocalist from his brief departure, uh, that being L.G. Petrov. And uh, this album's got an interesting story because Columbia, their record label in America, went behind the band's back and got a tie-in with Marvel to put the comic book character Wolverine on this album's cover, even though the song on the album called Wolverine Blues has nothing to do with the Wolverine. It is about a literal Wolverine. But as far as technicalities go, this album is quite good. It's got some just really fucking ferocious riffs. It It's kind of, I'd say, if you're looking for a point... If you're someone who's not terribly into death metal and you need a, a point to kind of slowly immerse yourselves, this album is a little, it's a little lighter while still being more brutal. You couldn't get this on like a top 40 radio station, but you could convince someone who's already a little more into the alternative side of things to, to give it a listen. It's, uh, it's quite good, I'd say. Right. What have you been re- listening to, Ryrie? Re- <laughs> I feel so violated from you in the last t- five or ten minutes in so many different ways, but that's I'll why I violate I'm... you more, motherfucker. Hey, Bring it on! I didn't say I didn't like it. Um, oh, hell it, yeah! It's just I don't know how to feel. I like that you elected not to talk about the fact that you listened to Drake's new album uh, this week. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot I listened to that. Honestly, anyway, that says so much more about it than I will anything get, else possibly could. I will get swiftly into my uh, segment because I've been listening to a lot of music recently, uh, much of which I would like to shout out. And it has been a while since we've talked about, uh, since we've had a, a, a proper segment to do this. So uh, the first thing I will shout out is a recommendation that was recommended to me, a record that was recommended to me by friend of the podcast, Bethany, aka Dremendous, uh, who has... Their own her own great fantastic band with Fukalama Fukalama Sixatron. I can never sell, sell I can never say their band name right because it's fucking insane. But anyway, it's it, a good band. It is a good band, yeah. a really sort of wacky, weird, kind of what the fuck am I listening to type band that makes you grateful that that kind of shit still exists and is still being made. Yes. Um, but yeah. She recommended to me an album by a band called The Thinking Fellers Union Local 282. <laughs> uh, and this band, this is a really interesting sort of experimental noise rock band uh, from the late 80s, early 90s. And their most famous record is called Strangers from the Universe. And this was what was recommended to me. Uh, it's a really interesting fusion of some of the scrappier indie rock stylings of the time with also a kind of art punk edge that's kind of avant-garde and noisy and psychedelic uh it's a it's a fantastic record it opens with uh a song called my pal the tortoise that i highly recommend checking out and it gets weirder from there uh it's the kind of record that where if you give a shit about like really tight cohesive album construction it'll probably drive you wild because for every fantastic five or six minute song there's an equal number of just absolutely bizarro 30 second to a minute and a half random shit that's just tossed off to make it feel as weird and and all over the place as possible but the thing is with a sound like this and with a band like this that kind of thing works because it adds to the experience as opposed to detracting from it um this is a frequently stunning album there's moments on here like guillotine which remind me of like the noisiest yola tingo tracks where there's this kind of like beauty through the haze of it And then there's moments that are just much more bizarro and out there, like The Operation, uh, The Fantastic Cup of Dreams, uh, Socket, and a song that absolutely stunned me because I was not expecting it. This album closes with a track called Noble Experiment, which actually is a kind of a cappella song that I recognized instantly because this entire song, all of the vocals and lyrics are not sampled, but interpolated by The National on their song, Not in Kansas. Uh, The parts of that song that are not just Matt Berninger rambling are taken directly from this song, something I didn't know uh, at all. And so when this song happened at the very end of this record, I was kind of gobsmacked by that recognition. 
but yeah this is a really strange record that i recommend to anyone who wants to just listen to something that sounds very unique and unlike anything else uh difficult to describe but absolute worth experience absolutely worth experiencing uh, a very very special record i listened to the new album from indie rock up and comer barty's strange farm to table uh Barty's- oh, yes and i i listened to this too so i will mm. chime in later but anyway. barty strange is a is a becoming slowly becoming a promising name that a lot of music outlets are talking about he's getting a lot of buzz he's getting a lot of push um, and I'd say deservingly so, like he's an interesting talent who has a real keen interest in exploring and kind of mashing together various different genres and styles within an indie rock lens. Like his favorite band is The National. He, made, he kind of broke through with a cover, with an EP of National Covers. And he very much adheres to this indie rock sensibility, but also infuses it with other forms of music essentially like his whole artistic ethos is in response to I guess the overwhelming whiteness of indie rock and it's kind of an attempt to I guess infuse blackness and black culture into indie rock he's kind of one of his bits is that he's kind of like the the one black dude at the national show essentially and his a lot of his early art has been about reckoning with what that image represents for him right is you know trying to overcome and sort of respond to the gentrification of a lot of indie rock something which is only getting truer and truer really throughout the 2010s even as you know people of color and black artists have had more of a foothold in various fringe genres and in cultural spaces you still have had almost like a continuing a continually pervasive glut of white girl indie artists essentially dominating the sphere and his music very much exists in response to that Uh, He has a song on this record called Cosines, which is really funny because it's like a trap song about like, about the cred he's getting from touring with indie rock Uh, artists. Yeah, I fucking hate that song. And I'm not surprised you hate it. And, And it is definitely a song that I think musically leaves a fair bit to be desired. It's not... It is musically and... I, I guess uh, to kind of give away what this song is about, he kind of just name checks a ton of indie artists is at least the meat of the first verse, I would say. Yeah. And look, I actually think that he gets away with the cheek of the lyrics because it's very much full of self-awareness. Uh, there, there's, And it's kind of like funny because it's like, it's exploring this place that this black artist has now found himself in communing with these incredibly white artists and vibing with them and kind of existing within their space and almost kind of indulging in aspects of the indie rock superstar life that are quintessentially white. Like, and, and he kind of you know, explores the dissonance of existing in that space. And what I will say is that the music is still not quite up to snuff for me. And I think that's a, a criticism that, mm. that you share as well. August. Yeah, I, I guess a lot of it for me is that I just think his, his blends of genres feel like he's only taking the very surface level elements of those genres and, and putting them together rather than indulging a little deeper, which mm. I think that's really all he needs is to just make the instrumentals a little better like if the instrumentals were better this would already be a point or two higher for me yeah certainly his uniqueness within his field is to be admired and he gets away with a lot of it and i guess there becomes a point where i'm like what am i getting beyond you just getting away with this and that's kind of a lot of what hinders my enjoyment I definitely think it's a step down from his first record, which came out in 2020, which is called Live Forever, which mm. I still think I was not quite able to get on the board of massive hype that, that that record kind of came with in terms of like everyone, every music publication lavishing it with praise. But I did think that it was a really interesting and promising showcase of a new artist doing things that are new with certain templates. And it feels as though he hasn't really capitalized on that too well here. Um, maybe he I, I have faith that he still definitely could I think he has the talent um, but as a 
and I think it, there again, I think there is an interesting dynamic of this black solo artist in his mid thirties, kind of breaking through into this very gentrified environment. And there are some songs on here that I think are really great. Like I think Heavy Heart, the opening track, is really yeah, great. That's... Uh, oh, I, I like oh. Mulholland Drive, the second track, a, a decent amount too. I think oh, there's fuck. there's I a. I remember the one song I like really like on there. <laughs> there's a, an acoustic song on here called Hold the Line, which I think one of the things that. I hold against this record somewhat is that there's a few too many of those quieter songs but hold the line really works because it's quite a powerful song where he sings to uh the the daughter of George Floyd uh and it's this very emotional and pointed song about I guess the black experience and unification in the wake of the current state of things and he does it he goes about it very tastefully and very powerfully and it has a lot of potency to it and so there are moments like that. The song I was thinking of earlier was Hennessy, which I really like how that song just, I think that's a moment where the album really feels properly massive and, and large, especially with that chorus that kicks in there and just, I think really elevates the tension of the record in a good way. And mm -hmm. yeah, I'm definitely with you that some of the quieter moments are kind of just like, eh. Yeah, it is a short record. It's a 35 minute album that feels like 25 minutes. Uh, there's just, I would like to see Bartiz level up a little bit in the ways that I was really expecting him to based on the debut. But anyway, if this kind of thing sounds vaguely appealing to you, I'd still recommend you check it out. You may enjoy it more than the two of us did. It seems to me a lot of people do seem to enjoy Bartiz more than me. So I don't want to discount that. But I'll talk about a couple more new releases that I listened to that were well, underwhelming to say the least. Uh, first of all is the new record from Foles, Life is Yours. Uh, oh, yeah, I also listened to this. Yeah, you did. You also. <laughs> now, Fucking Foles, mass memory loss. Foles, is an album, uh, Foles are a band, rather, that I have a lot of fondness for. Uh, I really enjoyed them as a teenager. And I think that, especially in their early days as well, with skittery math rock records like Antidotes, they really channeled something that was really, really interesting. Antidotes is kind of like a more two-dimensional kind of stripped back and nervy version of something like the first Everything Everything album or uh, the sort of math rock stuff that was happening at the time. There's a lot of great math rock rhythms and stuff in the early stuff. And then Total Life Forever, their second album, they kind of peered a lot of that back, but they brought in this beautifully accentuated atmospheric guitar tones and made a pretty rich, strong, solid uh, indie rock record. And ever since then, essentially what they've done is step by step, they have kind of built their sound more to be mass produced and have this kind of mass appeal and heaviness, essentially. They've kind of gone down the route of being this kind of riff band. And honestly, like records like Holy Fire and What Went Down, they are not, there's not enough ideas on them to really stand them up as full records. But I have nostalgic attachment to at least half of each of them. Uh, there are songs on both of those records that I really love still to this day. And uh, what went down is definitely probably one of the most songs I've, one of the records I've played the most in the car, albeit not so much in recent years. But when I first got a car and when in my first few years of being an adult and, and having kind of liberty, that album was a big soundtrack to that. Uh, and then in 2019, they put out two records, uh, a kind of double album. They split into two halves. Everything Not Saved Will Be Lost, which is just, for starters a fucking dumbass title like no shit like what is your profound point with this observation sir everything if, not if, said is alive <laughs> fucking across 80 minutes of music they released three or four pretty good songs and it was just fucking filler all the way down and so that was the point where i realized okay this is yeah they're going to keep heading in this direction and life is yours fittingly is their worst album yet and their most unremarkable even the little moments of interesting musical decisions that they made periodically on that double album none of those here it's just the same song like 10 11 times yeah it's nothing stands out nothing is terrible <sighs> nothing is good uh much of it is incredibly unremarkable it might as well be 42 minutes of static because it it just feels like the most bland facsimile of like indie dance or indie pop, whatever the hell you want to categorize, whatever this vacuum of interest is. 
Mm. I can't remember a goddamn song. On this. No, I can't either. I can maybe vaguely remember "Wake It Up," "Wake Me Up," but that's really it. And that yeah, was... it, it feels like the <sighs> most gutless and kind of non-committal record that they've made, which is a shame because I know they can do better. And that's the thing. Like I've sat here and I've told you the history of this band, and the reason it, for, it, for that is that. I have nothing to talk about with this album itself. So I might as well just talk about the band. Well, imagine if imagine if we had to do a full review of this. Like you couldn't. It it would be physically impossible. This album is an anti-meme. Imagine all the people. Imagine all the people. Anyway, the last thing I'm going to talk about is um is the new Weezer EP. Oh no, you actually listen to this? When you get 20 albums balls deep with Weezer, you're not exactly going to stop listening to them anymore. Uh, You kind of can't because it's like, well, I've come this far. It's a sunk cost fallacy, really. Yeah, it really is. And look, it's not as atrocious as the Spring EP that came out in March, but it's a couple notches above it, maybe. It has a song on it called Records that uh, I want to read you some of the lyrics to this because I sent them in the chat and I think that they are amusing enough to warrant repetition on record. No pun intended. I hear records in my head everywhere I go. I've got records in my head spinning out of control. They go round 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 again, round and round and round again, round and round and oh yeah, records in my head. I'm pillow drumming on the sofa. I keep on rocking past the coda. And if the world is ending, as I go out, you'll hear me singing. I don't pe- feel no pain when people make me mad. I don't hear a word they say, just the sound of scratches. And the worst bridge of the year. I feel Rihanna. I'm feeling Lana. I feel Nirvana. So you can fuck off. I, I love Bugs by Pearl Jam. It is the most ingratiating. Uh, fucking facsimile of a bad facsimile of a bad Weezer song that I could possibly imagine. Like, you you did this. You, the, it's the kind of song that's been written so many times by Rivers Cuomo before that when listening to it, you feel like you have dementia because you're, you're like, I've heard this before, have I not? There's songs on here like Blue Like Jazz, which is like, get this, trying to do the fucking you know Ozzy Osbourne fucking shitty heavy metal thing that Van Weezer did and it's called Blue Leg Jazz and listen to the I mean these lyrics are even more kindergartner level hats off to you you so you solved the Rubik's Cube turning the orange into yellow into blue blue like jazz show me how to be cool like that don't mind me I'm a little slow I can't play 16th notes. My mother's boy, learning his IOUs, don't have the huevos to attain goals like you do. My face is red. Your bill is due. I see your soul and it's black and blue. Like, I'm, I know you're like, why are you fucking still reading these lyrics, Riley? It's not fear. It's not fear. There's a song in here called The Opposite of Me. We are we, good we're, song not Robin Thick. We are R- Reavers. <laughs> we are Rivers sings over and over and over. Yeah, I'm gonna be somebody else. I'm gonna be somebody else. The opposite of me. And yeah, if you couldn't tell, I'm gonna be the opposite of me. <laughs> That's literally what he sings. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. I was confused. This is like yeah, I finally Asinine. reached. It's like we get, we get to the point where it's like Pinkerton was a parody of the kind of thing that he is doing fully straight faced here, where he's like, I finally reached the breaking point. Watch the man replace the boy. Maybe, maybe Weezer is like a government experiment to see how much people will take. He's truly like laughing at us because there's a song on here that's called what's the good of being good 
where you just know that he's like so smug sitting there like i don't have to try anymore like i have fucking phoned it in so many times that the people who are still listening for the most part me excluded i suppose are the people who actually get joy out of hearing me phone it in, who are going to vulgar or tourist their way into making me critically great again just for doing this shit. Like, it hasn't happened yet, but I I, I just know he's going to fucking fist punch his way to doing that. And it, It's the same old Alu Gobi. Yeah, and there's a song in here called Cuomoville, right? Yeah! So he, he's literally doing this whole thing oh, where he's man. like knowingly kind of like playing up the Rivers Cuomo personality and so his fans can be all like ironically enjoying this shit uh, and, and it's going to get to the point where that irony curdles into actually what Weezer are doing with this synthesis of you know slick imagine dragons radio pop sounds and commentary on the personality of rivers cuomo and the existence weezer make me more cynical than any other band and the, the worst part about it is that i know that people out there when i say all this shit are just like well what did you expect it's weezer how can you get mad at rivers cuomo he's just doing his Thing. you should come to expect this kind of thing from him why would you even expect them to do any better and the thing is i don't expect them to do better i never i i haven't any not since pacific daydream came out where i was like okay okay you, fo- you follow the white album up with this i get it you know to do better but you're not going to because not only do you not need to to, to like sell records and stuff it's more fun for you to not do that and you're going to get the same level of attention. In fact, you're going to get more attention for not doing that. And if there's anything that Rivers Cuomo is, it's an attention whore. So there you go, Rivers. Here's the attention you ordered. Would you like fries with that? Anyway. You know, he, he's the kind of guy who would make a joking video response and say, uh, yes, I would like fries on his fucking geeky ass TikTok page. We're all you fucking geeks. You know who I'm talking about. You fucking unsocial pieces of shit who still listen to Weezer unironically. You fucking like you're you're the you like w- listen to all these fucking Kmart bands, these fucking bullshit like discount rack ass like uh, Tiger's <laughs> foot or some bullshit. You motherfuckers wanted this. You motherfuckers are getting what you deserve. Vivaldi died in fucking vain. You get what you fucking deserve. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to forget the phrase, these fucking Kmart bands. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's like a notch below Walmart bands. Yeah. Which itself is a notch below Starbucks bands. Yeah. Is there anything, is, are there any uh, notches below Kmart bands? I, <laughs> Vape juice shop bands or something, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, they're, those are getting banned or whatever. We can't. They're, they're we getting, don't have those. Anymore. They're getting exiled from this country. So mm. anyway, uh, I guess they're not a factor. Let's talk about a record that has actually got something substantive to be said about it, and move into our first review of the day proper. Perfume Genius, as mentioned at the top of this episode. His last album, Mike Hadrius' last album, we covered it in the second ever episode of Jammed and Tea. Very much the Pretty podcast. positive review. From what it was I a remember. positive review. It was a strangely Ooh, divisive review for a positive review, but it was a positive review nonetheless. And I think the majority of us came out appreciating Mike's very distinctly kind of ghostly and sort of eerie take on pop music and i mean still to this day when i listen to that record i think it's one of the best produced pop records of recent years and it has a good amount of staying power i think because it balances its moments of muscularity out with its moments of genuinely haunting beauty so well and i think that it was a record that really 
fulfilled on the promise uh, that was set up by records like Too Bright and No Shade. Um, and this is an interesting prospect, this new album, because Ugly Season was actually recorded before Set My Heart on Fire immediately was recorded. And they were recorded kind of as sort of sibling records in a certain sense. One to kind of uh, fulfill the next stage of the kind of pop evolution of Mike from No Shape, which is a very kind of like flowery, colorful pop record to set my heart, which is a much kind of more dour and sort of almost industrial, but in a minimalist way, pop record. And this is kind of like, uh, aesthetically, I think quite similar to set my heart on fire immediately, but a lot of the uh, arrangements and the way that they are tinged towards kind of pop song structure, or at least kind of conventional song structure, are here more in per more constructed in purpose of avant-garde purposes. And a big part of why this is, is that this album was actually originally composed as the soundtrack to a theatrical piece. And it, it very much, I think, functions best in that setting there's a great short film yeah. that was posted on the perfume genius youtube page where you can see how the music kind of applies to its visual accompaniment and the way in which this record was designed i think speaks to both its greatest strengths and its limitations um, and i want to be diplomatic here because this is a record that has been getting a lot of praise online and so I don't want to feel as though I'm kind of going against the grain and not, you know, bestowing it with lots of love. But I do find it funny that people are kind of tripping over themselves to heap all of this unanimous praise on him now when the reaction to previous records is comparatively more muted when it feels like, I don't know, it just seems strange to me. I feel like those that set my heart and this are records that have so much in common and together showcase these different aspects of what Mike does that to me it's strange to I prefer I one say, so dramatically over the other but maybe I'm a bit you know I I would say I think some of it is the immediacy of the boldness of this album mm. and I think that's a good thing to kind of start off with is that it's very immediately apparent what the record has in mind for its kind of central vision it's a lot more uh like, like lyrically, very stripped back. Uh, a lot of these songs don't have so much as like two verses cobbled together onto them. And a lot of it is just relying on the kind of ebb and flow of this more classical cinematic orchestration. That And I, I guess at, at its core, that's what this record is kind of presenting itself as. It's this very, very like purposefully confrontational kind of weird sounding album mm. and i guess why you wouldn't get that same reaction of just overwhelming positivity is uh, compared to uh, set my heart on fire which i would agree is the better record of the two but i digress anyways uh point being i think to understand what makes that record so special takes a little closer analysis a little more attention uh, it's it's a record where I think the finer details and beauty are a lot more in evident, where this record's beauty is present within its ugliness mm. is uh, kind of the thesis statement yeah. Mr. Genius is going for. Part of the dichotomy of the you know accessibility of that record and the more avant-garde sensibilities of this is also reflected in that dichotomy between beauty and ugliness, right? Like, mm. Set My Heart is a record that is full of, of beauty, of moments that are kind of staggering in a very sort of stripped back but powerful way. And this is very much a record where Mike is interested in interrogating, again, to think of, I'm trying, I can't, I fail to think of a better word than ugliness, in fact. Uh, even if you compare the two album covers where the previous record has him kind of like standing in this kind of grayscale photo with this very strong and powerful kind of queer presence, essentially, uh, you know, shirtless and just having this sort of intensity about him where he feels very like much like he's kind of evoking a, a kind of like a, even an ancient Greek ideal of like perfect masculine beauty. Right. Whereas on this cover, you have this, you know, painting of him, essentially, this kind of blotches are distorted and the colors are messy and the form is completely gone. And it's this vision of maybe like the internal version of, of what kind of you would see if you were to peel back 
the person on the cover of the previous record. And it's worth bringing up this notion of like distorted figures and like distorted uh, physicality because it's, a, it's been a recurring interest of mm. uh, Mike's for basically his entire career. Records like Too Bright and especially No Shape, these are records about like hating your body and for like body dysmorphia and feeling as though like you cannot feel a sort of any sense of real comfort or you feel a sense of disgust with the limitations of your body with the kind of ugliness of the way your body operates with yeah. the kind of waste producing nature of your body and also like the ways in which ideas of one's body as a queer person are so influenced by external factors and that often leads one to have an incredibly negative association or relationship with one's body yes. or, or if they already have that it can exacerbate it and yeah i would say a lot of that is even brought to the head on a lot of this album's imagery which is very purposefully kind of uh body horror adjacent there's a lot of mentions of like contortion or limbs just kind of in the abstract like i think the the song title eye in the wall does a good job to speak to this kind of both uh trappedness you can feel as a queer person as well as this uh kind of sense of like when you take it a little more literally this more kind of cronenbergian distortion of reality and and this and yeah this kind of idea of bodily distortion and distortion of one's kind of personal internal self is mm. a lot of what this record is dealing in from its uh sparse but i think very and i will say i think despite how sparse a lot of the lyrics are they come off to me as quite evocative mm. they're like that's some that's a quality quality of the record that i personally really connected with that yeah for the minimal nature of the lyrics they do a great job at kind of letting you fill in the gaps and figure out the story or kind of message or meaning for yourself which yeah. i think quite that's quite an obviously personal enough statement for a queer person to make mm -hmm. yeah i think in this era like of a kind of what we're kind of experiencing right now and sort of alternative art as a kind of rejuvenation of interest in body horror aesthetics and stories like this is a time of films like Tatane and Crimes of the Future, very culturally relevant and big deal movies. And this feels like a, a work of art that slots in with them. And I would even slot it in with Jake. I don't, I'm curious whether or not you understand this comparison or not, or whether you vibe with it or not. But like, I was reminded at certain points aesthetically of uh, the recent remake of Suspiria, uh, which this very heavily oh, evoked absolutely. for me in tone and feel. And if you totally. look at the lyrics, um, as you were saying, August, I, I agree, they're incredibly evocative. Like, I think the best place to zero in is the title track, uh, which has a lyrical sensibility that reminded me very much of Arca's recent albums, uh, and just Arca in general, because Arca talks about bodily disgust and bodily contortion in a very similar way as Mike does here. Uh, he has lyrics like, I'm hideous, raving, feeling my fantasy, Turned from God, slick with rot, thick as Vaseline, knee deep and filthy, and then a very archaic bitch. It's ugly season, and I love it. Notice the tongue, the shape. Don't look away. Notice the tongue, split black pit. Notice the tongue. I'm reeling. I'm keening, ready for anything. I turn from love. I turn from solace. It's ugly season, and I love it. Like that sense of I am this disgusting kind of horrible you know mess of, of ugliness to myself and to you but i'm gonna make you fucking steer into it and i'm gonna make you fucking confront that you know mm. also i i like a lot of the way that that particular verse you brought up really just mask kind of basks in the whole like evocation of of bodily fluids and flesh mm. it that stuff is is great universally here mm -hmm. i i love that kind of kind of sickly kind of embrace of ugliness i guess you will for yeah, lack of a better word it goes right back to a song on my favorite perfume genius record which is his second album put your back into it the song 17 where he talks about like wanting to be literally dismembered and kind of stuffed inside of a violin and then covered in semen like he, he talks about 
in, in incredibly graphic detail, like wanting to be real Hannibal hours here. <laughs> yeah. Like <laughs> wanting to be just taken apart in the most real tangible physical sense. And one of the triumphs of this record, I think is it's the, it maybe the first time, at least since that album, where that theme and those lyrical ideas are matched with music that feels as, you know, broken and, and contorted and sort of taken apart as the ideas and the images within the lyrics. It is a sparse record. It's a record with musical ideas that sometimes do outstay their welcome, I will say, and sometimes don't necessarily cohere in the ways that I would want them to. But I think more often than not, the songs do give an evocative and potent experience. And I actually have been on a bit of a journey with this record that I'll actually save until a bit later on. But um, Jake, since you haven't had a chance to speak much yet, I'm curious what you think of some of the things that we've been saying about kind of what this record, the vibes this record gives off and, and your experience listening to it. I've been mildly nervous about these two segments for the podcast this week because I am not really able to properly relay with words why it is that I only just kind of enjoy this experience and really enjoy the next record just because I feel like these two experiences are so heavily textural with the music that it's it's very, very difficult to describe, especially because I feel like they're at such opposing ends of the spectrum and approach and that this feels like a really sparse really intentional record when it comes to its construction whereas the other record we're going to talk about today feels almost uh exploratory in its messiness but i i think with this album the strange thing is that i i kind of like when it leans into being more confrontational and being like more unfriendly because those are the moments where I think Mike's sounds are at their most interesting. I think for me anyway, can the more compelling moments on here are, I won't say considerably backloaded, but I will say I just think that the record is more successful on its back half. I think that songs particularly like I in the Wall are really, really captivating. I love how driving the percussion is on a song like this. And I, again, that you all spoke to some of the lyrics and the themes that this song specifically was getting at. And I think that it's a resounding kind of thematic success that I really, really respond to that like, just like on the last record is that I relate a lot to a lot of the feelings of body dysmorphia, especially the sort of like general simultaneous ebb and flow of acceptance and hatred that's on this album. It sort of seems like uh, it's flowing in between, you know, hating what you see in the mirror and then trying to embrace the, the, the hideousness of it that you see and then trying to sort of uh, take it and go with that. It's just that the music reflecting it, I often find to be a bit of a clash in a way that I don't really understand sonically, I guess. Songs like the, the first two, for example, uh, Just a Room and Harem, are periodically very interesting. It's just that it almost feels intangible in how the lyrics and the sounds of the song feel not even like at odds. They just feel like they're on different planets. Like, I don't really know that there's about like a 60-40 split on this album where I actually feel like the music is doing the lyrics any like service like when they're actually interacting and mingling and like do something whereas the other times it just they sort of just happen to be there and it feels like the diversity for the sound that he's going for here with these really sparse arrangements that feel really really interesting on first listen but also just upon repeated visits I just I, I kept getting kind of less and less out of and I found myself at a considerable distance with a lot of the songs on here, songs like Scarzo, for example, where I, I'm just, I, I'm not certain what Mike is, is 
doing and I'm just completely unsure as to how I'm meant to feel about its ideas musically whereas I'm usually on the same level with him lyrically so this was a, a very mixed experience for me personally I I must say I I, I kind of relate to your uh some of your qualms because I I do think some but not all of the the instrumentation the kind of classical arrangements I think some of it comes off as a little quaint more than anything and and not quite as good at evoking this mood and tone he's really trying to let his audience wallow in. And I find that's a bit of a detriment at points, especially when I'm so interested in the lyrical content, but the musical content backing it up at times cannot feel as forward thinking and esoteric and abstract as the lyrics it's associated with for me and i think you know of course you're welcome to disagree and say oh i think all of the instrumentation is just uniformly fantastic i i think some of it does a really like the aforementioned eye in the wall does a really great job at evoking this like panicked terrified tone that song is amazing and i think a lot of the back half is pretty substantially great it's just a a lot of my issues come in the front half where these songs i feel they lack a certain urgency or i don't know readiness to them there's like some spark something that i feel is a little intangible to explain that's kind of missing to really bring it home for me Mm -hmm. well here's my little mini journey with this album by all um, means and i promise i won't take too long <laughs> and by by a promise i won't take too long i mean i make no promises so i've listened to this album six or seven times this week uh and the first few times i w- will be honest the first few times i got almost nothing out of it and i was like i can tell there's something here but it's just evading me and it was like that for a long time and then I guess on the more recent listens, I started to, certain elements of it started to click with me more and more. And I started to appreciate a little bit more what Mike was going for. And it certainly helped to just kind of separate myself from the internet hype cycle around it because no one, I've seen very few people actually interrogating this album in any meaningful way when they praise it. So it helped to kind of separate myself from that a lot. And then last night, I listened to this record in Pitch Black Darkness, which was, you know, obviously now the perfect setting for it uh and i kind of listened to it with the context of a record that it reminded me of in in a lot of respects which is the a record we talked about very recently in our Bjork retrospective biophilia uh which is an album in which Bjork sort of takes the perspective of various kind of organic forces or things uh whether it be sort of like stars or viruses or Uh, various forms of matter essentially things from that perspective kind of tries to draw analogies between like the the life cycles or like the processes of organic matter and like human psychodramas essentially and in a lot of ways this record to me feels like an interrogation of like the construction of the human body and then the deconstruction of it so it's cleaved into ve- into two very distinct halves. First half is, as you've both said, the far more ephemeral of the two, and the far less tangible and at points, yes, the meandering. And I definitely think that there are certain aspects of which that meanderiness holds me back from fully loving it. But I think it's purposeful. And again, I don't know that um, Mike has intentionally done it this way, but listening to it, it kind of felt like the first half, especially the first four songs, it kind of felt like the album was sort of coming into view gradually more so with each song until you get to pop song, which is the first kind of fully fledged song for as in terms of like construction and progression, I think. And a lot of ways it felt like in my head while I was listening to this, I was picturing like the evolution of man and on a more, (laughs) on a less pretentious level, hopefully like, the splitting of cells and the kind of development of an organism starting from like the conception of something at the very beginning of the record this vague haze gradually with cells dividing with things building up something coming into view in real time 
and eventually becoming like a, a, a tangible body or a tangible kind of like form with pop song the fourth track here and though the record I think if it is indeed doing that sacrifices some of the holistic songful satisfaction of individual songs to get to that point it feels as I listen to it more and more as though that is somewhat the intended effect like something coming into form some kind of physical form evolving or developing in front of our eyes then you get the scares I mean both halves of this record end with these kind of like solo instrumental sort of piano pieces that have these uh, different feels and themes. I really appreciate Scarzo and C note actually. Scarzo has kind of an Arvo Pert feel to me. It has this kind of real modern classical dissonance to it uh, in terms of the way that it's constructed and the melodic choices and that sort of thing. It's very off putting in a way that feels very in tune with the record. And it's particularly where it goes in the second half. So the first half of it is kind of like this coming into form of, of some kind of organic matter. And then the second half is kind of like the deconstruction of an organic form. Like, so if the first half is about like a human being sort of coming into existence, then the second half is kind of about like the deconstruction, like the inevitable decomposition essentially of the human being. Uh, and I guess in a lot of senses, another thing I thought of alongside Suspiria was uh, Under the Skin, the movie as well. Feels like it, it has Ooh. a kind of similar development where the start of that movie is super like avant-garde and formless, like a being just kind of coming into existence through means that are very uh, abstractly expressed, essentially. And then the being having this kind of, you know, going through these various trials or this various attempt to kind of reproduce and, and, and survive, and then just shedding its skin at the end, deconstructing entirely. I think the record has, this record has this very similar structure to Under the Skin to me. And so the first half, the, the form building, like the, the, the organic beauty of the human form, right? You have a lot of softer, more elegant sounds. Like pop song is this incredibly tactile, plinky, pretty song. And it feels as though, yeah, something beautiful or, or something pure is coming into existence. And then the second half is the rotting, you know? As soon as something becomes ripe a living being, whether it be a fruit or a human being, hits a period of ripeness, a period of kind of optimal development, it starts to decay. And you have the decay taking place in the second half of this record from Ugly Season onwards, which interestingly is one of the strangest songs musically, because it's kind of like, it has some of the more playful, lighter sounds of a song like Pop Song, but it kind of curdles them. It, it adds more stuff into the mix and creates this weirder kind of dysmorphic twin to that song coupled by lyrics that are much more overtly dark and ugly, no pun intended. Uh, and then you get Eye on the Wall, which is, I will agree, the greatest song here. Uh, one of my favorite Perfume Genius tracks, an utterly hypnotic piece of music. The rhythm section here, you've shouted out the drums, I will shout out the bass, in particular does an amazing feeling of just adding so much weight to this song. And something I want to comment on here as well, is we've talked about how this is a lyrically sparse record, but we haven't really talked about the vocals themselves. And now Mike Hadrius, as you'll know, if you've listened to any Perfume Genius record in the past, he has an incredibly expressive voice and he has a good range as well. Like he's able to really reach into his depths and he's able to do this beautiful falsetto. For the majority of this record, he sings in this incredibly strained style. Like if you actually listen to how he's singing, he is hitting some higher notes in his vocal cords that feel like he's actively tearing them as he sings, like on pop song, for instance, he's singing so highly and with such a breathy falsetto there that he doesn't really even sound human. At points, he sounds like he's approximating the sound of some kind of alien being, which is very in keeping for him. And then there's other points where he just will outright distort his voice, which again, he did on parts of Set My Heart on Fire as well, but he does it here too. And throughout the whole thing, you get a very strong sense that Mike is depersonalizing himself, re re kind of rendering himself like animalistic, kind of inhuman, in keeping with the sense of like feeling not at home in the form you occupy. And that, I think, adds so much power to the sort of textural arrangements that are happening here is his voice sounding so unusual and, and, and frayed. Uh, and then like you get, 
after I in the Wall, you get a song which is going to be one of my favorite songs on the record, Photograph, which is incredibly beautiful musically, just but also like twisted as well and full of these clashing textures and lyrically some of his most evocative writing where you have this sort of sense of love for another person, this real sort of devotion that's expressed. Uh, again, a super uh, queer expression of it as well. On the grave in his place, I take a photograph in the shade where he lays, I paint a portrait. This, you know, one person revealing themselves to the other and the other person kind of documenting that and possessing that form of another person. You were meant for me and I for you. In the clay of his shape, I trace an autograph. Again, like claiming ownership over someone else's form. It's like this connecting with another in this super, super physical way, um, but also in a way that kind of evokes the language of art as well. Uh, and that goes into Hellbent, which is an utterly harrowing piece of music. Like what is happening on this track is difficult to describe, except to say loud, dissonant, uncomfortable, and mildly, if not moderately, terrifying. It's actually, this song is a sequel to the song Jason off of oh, Set yes, My Heart that's on right. Fire Immediately, yeah. which is a song that tells a story of a person who seeks the company of a male escort, essentially. And it's kind of like the, the most human connection that they have felt for whatever reason. Perhaps they are their sexuality has to be repressed in real life or something. It's this sort of fragment of a story about uh, a person who finds a momentary connection with someone who they pay to supply that connection. And so that, that song, Jason, was quite a powerful little short story from the, first, uh, from the last record. And this is kind of a sequel to it, where the sort of gentle innocence of that story is, it's kind of curled here into like a, a dependent relationship, where this person is like screaming, doesn't have their phone, is like on their way to Jason's, this person, like, in some form we don't know how they're getting there their arm is cut their blood is their blood is all over them they are essentially having this horrible time potentially i don't know in the wake of a of a hate crime or potentially an, an incidence of self-harm and kind of hoping that if he puts on a show for jason that he will soften and give him a loan and kind of help him out and it is this you know low moment it's this low point at the climax of the record where all sort of sense of beauty, all sense of like connection with another person or with oneself is kind of just curdled into this total rot uh, in ways that honestly actually remind me a little bit of Nine Inch Nails and the way they sort of sonically uh, explore the ideas of decay and rot. Uh, and it's a very kind of powerful ending to the record before the kind of C note gives you that sort of epilogue. And yeah, that's kind of basically how I've come to sort of understand this album in my own sense like I don't expect this explanation or this theory to make it work for anyone else necessarily but I think this is a record that I think is one of the more rewarding albums in terms of persevering with it that we re reviewed this year at least for me and I'm starting to understand it more and more and more even if I think that by design some of the things it's trying to do, you know, be this abstract evocation that's meant to be accompanied by this theater performance piece, that's definitely giving it limitations, right? But still, those aside, there's a lot of substance here that I think builds on ideas, lyrics, themes, images that Mike has been interested in for a long time. And I'm pleased, at least, even if the music doesn't resonate for all of us, that those ideas can come through and be, you know, interesting enough to talk about and uh, comment on because I think that the whole wave of art we're getting at the moment to do with body horror and to do with uh, gender in relation to the human body, Tatane and Crimes of the Future on the film side, this and the Kick albums from Arca on the other side, it's a really interesting melting pot uh, and artistic exploration that I hope continues to be a thread in popular art more or less because yeah. it's really really cool to see. And it's proving to be one of the more interesting developments in like what's culturally popular in the world of like artistic film and, and music. So yeah, I, I really, I really dig this. I've come to really love it. All right. So favorite tracks and ratings. We shall start back with uh, yeah. Jake. Three favorite tracks for me. Favorite's going to be I Am The Wall. And I really like the run of I Am The Wall photograph and Hellbent. I think it's a really like solid 
ending to the record uh, before the formal ending there. Least favorite song is probably uh, probably Scarzo. Um, and I'm going to give the album a 6 out of 10. Respectable. Right. Um, uh, for me, I would say one of my favorites is I Am The Wall, uh, Hellbent, and you know what? I like Harem, the second song on here a fair bit. So I'll, I'll throw that on here too. Um, I would have, you know what? I'll say my least favorite is probably also Sherzo. It's it's okay, but I don't think as memorable or bold as anything else on here. This gets a 6.5 from me. Nice. Holy shit. It's a star guy. I like that guy. He's cool. <laughs> August, no one is better at you than, than making a person feel like there's a massive joke they're not in on. Um, <laughs> my three favorite tracks it's are... It's a star fella. This is a little fella. Star He's man. a little star. In the, in the sky. Uh, my three, three favorite songs are I Am The Walrus or whatever it's called, uh, Hell Bent, <laughs> and I will say Photograph. Yeah, that three-track one is pretty fucking great. Least favorite song is probably... Harem, actually. Uh, I just think I like what, a lot of what it's going for individually. It's just a little bit too long, but again, it works well in terms of the concept I said. Uh, and yeah, I'm going to give this a 7.5. So that gives us an average rating overall for Perfume Genius's Ugly Season of 6.7. All right, yeah. let's move into our second review of the day, which is the new album from Asian Glow, Stall, Fruit Stalls, or something like that. Um, stalled Memory. Yeah. Stalled, 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 so, stalled, stalled, uh, stalled bowels. All right. Is that what it's called? Yep. Yeah. So Asian Glow, an artist we've talked about on this podcast before. One of the last reviews we did last year was for the split album that Asian Glow was involved in with Paranul and Sonhos Tomam Konta. And Asian Glow, like those artists, has been consistently putting out music with this kind of lo-fi bedroom aesthetic adjacent to shoegaze and emo. And they're very much part of the same wave as those acts. And I have been waiting for us to really have the opportunity to review a fully fledged album of theirs. I'm sad that we didn't get to review the Sonhos Tom and Conta album so we could have the kind of trifecta, but I'm sure they'll come through with another project fairly soon. Oh, with, these within artists a are couple all, months. These artists are all pretty prolific, but Asian Glow, I've been waiting on particularly because I was really fond of their album Cold Fickle, which I shouted out in our Overlooked Albums of 2021 video at the end of last year. And that's a record that I think had a lot of promise, a lot of really great songs, didn't quite kind of fully come together as a capital G great album, but the best moments on it, like No Exit, for instance, one of my favorite songs of last year, really, really stood out. And so I was waiting to see where this artist would go next, because of those three artists I mentioned, I think Asian Glow is maybe the most accessible or at least the least harsh and the most kind of warm in terms of sonic textures. Uh, and this new record truly feels like something that they have been working on for a long time. There is a lot of meticulous detail weaved into these songs. These are noisy lo-fi arrangements that are very much focused on the sort of distorted guitars and these longing vocals, but they are also arrangements that are densely packed with lots of guitar overdubs, lots of detail, and most prominently, a very notable string section that comes through on a lot of this record that really gives it this additional level of being sort of fleshed out of color, of, of texture that I think is really, really appreciated and shows that this artist is continuing to build up their sonic template and toolkit. Uh, it's particularly impressive to see as well, considering these are bedroom artists. And I'm assuming all of the strings are MIDI because I can't see how they would be able to afford real strings. But because, because of the way this all this is mixed, it all sounds kind of of a, one, of a muchness. So it's all kind of happening together. There isn't really any space between any instrumentation, which I could see being a turnoff of this style of music, but I think works here. Uh, I'm curious for what you guys think about this project, how you feel it lives up to some of the previous music we've talked about from this artist and or how you feel this artist fits in this broader wave of, of shoegaze. I was really, really overwhelmingly in love with the songs that were on that sort of three-way split LP that we talked about last year. Asian Glow songs 
broadly speaking, were my favorites, which is why when I went and re or and visited uh, the project called Fickle, and I was eh, kind of underwhelmed by that, I was just sort of like waiting to see if perhaps the split LP that they did maybe was a, a launching off point for them to maybe grow and diversify their sound, make things a little bit more interesting. And to my fucking like I, I am set, happy to report that that seems to be the case because it seems like they're not only capitalizing off of that sound that they were exploring but building off of it too there are so many things that this ended up reminding me of all of it being good uh most prominently being the projects of phil elverham surprisingly enough i was really really reminded of some of his noisier stuff like ocean roar or even Wynn's poem at times, or even just like the microphones projects and how you have this really, really dense sound that like on here borders on being like, it's so bright that it's borderline noise pop at times. Like every instrumental presence here has an incredible amount of physicality, especially those strings that Riley mentioned. They are a positively fantastic addition to the overall sound here. The vocals are are strained and kind of, uh, they're very, I, this is not a, a uh, slight against the record when I say that they're kind of pathetic sounding. They, they have a, a, a sense of kind of longing to them that really befits the sort of uh, themes that the album is going for, a lot of which are about loneliness, longing, uh, sort of isolation and the the album sort of blows that up into its biggest possible sound it reminds me of uh the paranormal album in that respect of just you know taking these really isolated singular feelings and then sort of making them sound as big and jagged as possible just in a completely different sort of genre venue on the the, the softest possible side of, of something like shoegaze and on the longer tracks on here it really just becomes absolutely stunning to me you have stuff like uh look close knows the reflection or um faltering waver or one of my favorite songs on here station blue uh broiled wrist which i think is a deeply underrated track you, you just have him exploring everything about this really, really multifaceted fifth wave emo sound. Uh, and, and I really just can't get enough of it. I, I think that if the album has any missteps for me, it's probably in that I think it's, it's a little formless structurally, but I don't know if that's just because I haven't listened to this enough and latched onto all of its more coherent ideas just because this is such a wide sound palette and maybe it just sort of bleeds together a bit more naturally or maybe the album isn't as as sharp and defined as maybe it could be but it feels like this is capitalizing on all of the potential that I've witnessed in this artist thus far um there are sort of less significant moments on here but they're you know they're so brief like the in incredibly short sneezing part two which is the the low point on the album for me purely because it just doesn't last long enough to develop into anything legitimate and then it goes into the title track immediately after which is again another album standout for me uh so it's really i i really enjoy it it's really fantastic if, if you like stuff like this uh another um thing that really reminded me of was the sort of post emo sound of the early uh, World is a Beautiful Place record, stuff like Harmlessness, stuff like Whenever, If Ever. I think that that's mm. like a one-to-one -one lineup of sensibilities, frankly. If you like that, I think you'll love this. Uh, and yeah, I really like this, but it also is definitely something that I feel like they can build off of and make even better in the future. It's not quite up to the singularity of something like maladaptive daydreaming or to see the next part of the dream. Uh, I still feel like Asian Glow has yet to come through with a project that I feel like will truly put him on the same level as his peers are, and, and is at least in my eyes, but this is a great step in the right direction. And it's one of the more singular sounding records I've heard this year. And it's just a really great album to lose yourself in. I think that the string arrangements add a lot to these songs, and particularly I think the record hits a really great stride early on with the first three tracks that kind of build and this the heft that they carry. The opener I think is particularly strong in this 
um, respect. When Summer, I think, is a mid-album highlight as well. Some of the most beautiful melodies there. And I really love uh, the nine minute no look close nose reflection as well, which has some great progressions and drum parts in it. In general, I think that it's a, a nice refinement uh, and fleshing out of the core sound of this artist to album length. Its biggest drawback is that I suppose it lacks the diversity that one might want in terms of texture from a record of this length, although Paranals, the other art albums that have been mentioned from artists in this ilk are equally kind of fairly single note, and that isn't necessarily a problem with those. Perhaps, yeah. Yeah, it's just a kind of refining of the aesthetic, and uh, yeah, per, per, yeah. But, but I think it can potentially get a little bit grating here because of how densely packed these mixes are. It can make it a little bit more difficult to kind of tell certain songs apart because sometimes the melodies can be so densely packed underneath the noise. But still. Uh, I enjoy this record a great deal and I think that it's a nice follow-up to their previous record. Yeah, I, I guess I don't have a ton to say about this record myself, but I must confess I didn't really take to this as I was hoping to. I guess for me, definitely the melodies feeling very homogenous is some of it. But I, I guess a lot of this for me is like, I I really don't feel this record stands out from uh asian glows contemporaries in a lot of ways i find terribly meaningful quite honestly like there's some of these songs i think when this album leans heaviest into the more spacey atmospheric outdoorsy kind of summery feeling tracks i think moments like that are where the record really hits its peak and feels like its own voice but generally i just can't say i really get on with this album i think it just feels a little interchangeable in places with the name behind it if the english language vocals weren't here i could easily mistake this for just like some so-so paranormal tracks or if it were you know a little more i guess I, it's not black gaze tinged enough for me to ever confuse it with a uh, sonos uh, etc. But I guess for me, it just straddles the line of being a little too familiar for me and, and, and not in a way that is like nostalgic or comforting, just in a way that doesn't feel as bold as other uh, records of this ilk have to me in the past. Um, Got to check out that Maladaptive Dra Daydreaming album just because that I'm got to hear that i'm yeah, sure it's check it out for completism's sake although i don't complete yeah i don't I, feel I, that I that will be something that lingers with you too much more than this too does. much okay. um i mean well, paranormal is really just kind of one of a kind but um perhaps it, yeah and, perhaps and i guess some of these maybe, other artists yeah. like asian glow and sonos Son and Conta for people who i guess have certain aesthetic preferences are acts that maybe do better in a shorter format than than they push themselves to here uh, i yeah. think it works but that's because mm. i'm able to get on with the aesthetic from the jump and if it's a bit it, much already from yeah. the jump then an hour of it is gonna is gonna wear on you yeah no i look i i did my best to get immersed in this i went on a fucking outdoor adventure where i was like crawling through storm drains and shit <laughs> and that's not even a joke <laughs> Uh, I didn't like, think it was. Okay, fair enough. You know, uh, I just, I just really tried to get on board with this, and I'm look the the loser here is me because I, you know, didn't get a experience that particularly connected with me out of it. And, and I guess if if you're someone who finds this style like me a little played out on this album, I mean, it's always paranormal. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I mean, I guess that's what I have pick to say. and choose highlights, I suppose, as well. Like, I'd recommend yeah. listening to uh, the EP that this artist put out last year, PT.2345678, and still, which is a hell of a mouthful, is a great sort of condensed dose of this artist, just one 18 minute song that is uh, worth checking out. I think really, really powerful stuff. Likewise, I would recommend the song uh, No Exit off of the Cole Fickle album. That song is. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the best songs in this whole genre. Um, and of course, the downfall of the Neon Youth split album. That is the Which best. Which I do like. Ones. Yeah. yeah. I, we've done a review on it. Watch it. It's good. Yeah. It's a good review. So we will continue to follow the escapades of this wave of music. 
all of these artists, by the way, and I'm not paid to say this or anything, but they're all these artists are signed by Longinus Recordings, uh, one of the best uh, independent labels working today. Longinus Recordings. Longinus Recordings. If I may be picky. Oh, fair enough. Uh, uh, one of the best labels working today with a consistently fantastic uh, schedule of a small number of artists, but who are always putting out small, interesting prolific uh, batch of artists. Yeah, and I so, think, yeah. Support that They're label cool. so they can continue to be able to press and release this music, um, especially when it comes to physical formatting. And so that these artists can continue to be able to make records by making money off of Bandcamp as well, which is the only way that any of you should be consuming any of these artists because it's the only way they're going to make any money. But it, it's um, the only way they're going to sound good too. Yeah, that's, you're listening that's to. very true. But yeah, let's rate this bad boy. All right, Jake, what oh, are your yeah. three favorite tracks in rating? my three favorite tracks are stalled flutes means look close knows the reflection and uh yeah station blue broiled wrist least favorite is sneezing part two i give the album an eight out of ten all right august you're out thanks it's kind of hard for me to remember much of the individual highlights from this for me quite honestly I did like the opening track, uh, Lit Lips, The Bracken. I'll say uh, fucking Curled from the Roots Part 2. And uh, It's Okay to Cry was a later song that I thought wasn't too bad either. Um, mm -hmm. Least favorite? Um, I don't know. If... It's all much of a muchness, really. It's hard to pick absolute yeah. standouts or absolute lowlights. Exactly. Like it's kind of something where if you like it you're liking all of it if you're media if you're mid on it yeah mm -hmm. oh holy shit look at that it's a star it's, it's a star fella what's he doing in there what's, what's he doing there uh yeah so i i guess i'll just pass on that and this gets a oh, fuck i should have done this earlier oh my god how embarrassing cool this is what i call pillow talk Hmm. Five out of ten. Well, five then. out of ten for me. Uh, it's right. okay. Check it out if you're more into it. Okay, my three favorite tracks are Lit Lips, The Bracken, Look Close, Look Close, Knows the Reflection, that, that, that one. And I think the standout here, and as much as there can be one, because for me, the consistent aesthetic is a positive, more or less. But I do think that mm. the best track here is Faltering Waver, which is a great sort of expansive piece of music that I think is the best utilization of the strings on this album so I recommend okay. that one if you want like an individual track to check out and i'm going to give this album oh, at least favorite no i'm going to give this album a very comfortable very strong and very deserving 7.5 much like the last record we reviewed so sick that gives us an average overall of 6.8 for asian glows fruit stalls something about beans so, something memes yeah mimes and memes this eating beans um anyway <laughs> bars <laughs> anyway yeah let us know at home what you think of either of the records we've discussed today did you enjoy them more or less than us or about the same either way we want to hear from you in the comments below if you're listening on spotify or apple you can head on over to the video by following the link in the description and leave us feedback there if you enjoyed this episode please consider giving us a like uh, and subscribing to the channel if you have not already both of those things help us an awful lot if you want to go above and beyond and support the channel directly, you can hit the join button on our YouTube page. And for just $1 a month, you can support us directly, get to be one of our besties, get your name featured in the title call of every episode on this channel. Plus, you get priority comment response. Plus, if you want to recommend us a record to listen to, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. Now, if you'll excuse us all, August has some Toby Mac to be listening to. I have some news to be listening to. And you have one more thing left to hear. As always, folks, uh, you know what? Starman, you can, you can take us out. Now that... <laughs> Fucking killed Starman. Forever.